this refrigerator for five years now. And I'll admit, I don't know how it works. Why do you ask? Well, I've been thinking. Why don't I spend some time tomorrow telling you and Fred about our air temp car air conditioner? It works a lot like your refrigerator. And here are some of the units of the air temp air conditioner system I was telling you and Fred about last night, Bill. And there's one just like it in that car over there. Now, uh, let's get on with the story of how they operate. As you both know, the basic idea of car air conditioning is to draw the warm air from the passenger compartment and fresh air from outside, filter it, cool it, remove the moisture, and then blow the cooled air back into the car. I sure wish understanding how it does this was that simple, though. It is, Bill. But before we answer the how, maybe we should ask, what is refrigeration? Or for our present purpose... What is air conditioning? That's right, Lou, since air conditioning is a form of refrigeration. Right, Tech. Actually, an air conditioning system is somewhat like a home steam heating system. Only operating in reverse. That's true. In the steam heating system, for example, you heat the water to change it into steam. Then you pipe the steam to radiators throughout the house to heat the house. The radiators get warm and the heat from the steam is radiated to the cooler air in the house. So the air absorbs the heat and becomes warmer. As the steam loses its heat, it changes back to water and returns to the boiler, where the process starts all over again. Well, that's the steam heating system in a nutshell, Tech. And now, with the air temp air conditioning system, you do just the opposite. Instead of heating the air, you're going to cool it. And instead of making the air absorb heat, you want to draw the heat out of it. That's the main difference, Tech. Now, water works all right to give off heat, but it isn't good enough for absorbing heat in this type of air conditioning system. And so we'll have to use something else that will absorb heat. Lots of heat. And this something else is called Freon. It's a product that will absorb heat like crazy. In fact, it will absorb heat from any substance whose temperature is way down as low as 40 degrees below zero Fahrenheit at sea level. Now, the greatest heat absorption occurs at the point where the liquid freon vaporizes or changes to a gas. Because of the low temperature at which this change takes place, freon makes an ideal product to use in our system. Then this freon is a gas, right? Basically, yes. But you know that any gas can be changed to a liquid if you put it under pressure. And so we put this Freon under pressure so it will behave like we want it to. Is the amount of pressure used important, Lou? Yes, it is, Bill. Pressure is one of the important principles we work with in the operation of the air conditioning system. By varying this pressure, we can cause the Freon to change from a liquid to a gas and back to a liquid when we want it to. But why compress it at all if it's colder as a gas? Well, that's a good question, Bill. When it's a gas, it has absorbed some heat, and we have to take that heat out so we can use the Freon over again to absorb more heat. And so we put it under pressure, and then remove the heat, which changes it back to a liquid. Then we can use the Freon again. By being able to change Freon from a liquid to a gas and back to a liquid, we can control the point at which it evaporates or changes to a gas, and that's the point at which it absorbs the most heat. And you want to remember this, Bill. When you put a liquid under pressure, you raise the temperature at which it will turn to a gas. Isn't that the principle we use in the engine cooling system when we add a pressure radiator cap, Lou? That's right, Fred. Let's use that as an illustration. As you know, the engine cooling system uses water, which vaporizes or turns to gas, at a temperature of 212 degrees Fahrenheit at sea level. By using a pressure radiator cap, we put the water under pressure so it won't change from a liquid to a gas until it reaches a temperature higher than 212 degrees. And so to get back to the air conditioning system, by controlling the temperature at which Freon will change from a liquid to a gas and back to a liquid, we have a workable method of operating an air conditioning system. We'll see why in a minute, but first, we have to accept the fact that heat is always transferred from a hot object to a cooler one. And that's important in refrigeration or air conditioning, which is the same. Uh, give them an example, Lou. Right, Tech. 
Let's suppose that we have two sealed containers. One has water in it, the other has liquid freon. If we put a flame under the water container, the heat from the flame will be absorbed by the water. When it has absorbed enough heat, the water will vaporize or turn to a gas. Because liquid freon turns to a gas at a very low temperature, it doesn't need a flame to make this change. And here's why. Let's assume that the temperature of the air surrounding this freon container is 70 degrees. Hey, I'm beginning to see the light. This 70 degree temperature is warm enough to turn the liquid freon to a gas, right? You got it, Bill. The important point to remember is that in both cases, the liquid is changed to a gas by absorbing heat. Now keep that in mind. You remember that we mentioned a moment ago that we can increase the temperature of a liquid by increasing the pressure on it. By applying pressure, we raise the temperature at which it will turn from a liquid to a gas. You know, Lou, a diesel engine is a good example of this principle of raising temperature by compression. Air is compressed in the combustion chamber to such a pressure that it becomes hot. Then, when you inject fuel into that hot, compressed air, bam, you have an explosion as the hot air ignites the fuel. Well, that's an excellent example, Fred, of how pressure increases temperature. But, of course, we're not concerned with the explosion phase. But your example does apply to our case in this way, Fred. Our Freon, under pressure, has its temperature raised to a point where it is easy for us to make it behave as we want it to when we vary the pressure. Now let's take a look at the air conditioning system as installed in the car and follow through the various units which make up the system. Let's start with the receiver mounted on the right front side rail. That's where we keep our supply of liquid Freon. You might compare this receiver to the water chamber of a steam boiler. That's a good comparison, Tech. Now, let's take a look at the sight gauge mounted here in the luggage compartment. It serves the same purpose as the water level gauge on the boiler. We can check the amount of Freon in the system by checking the sight gauge. But there's one big difference between this sight gauge and the water level gauge on a boiler. We can check our supply of Freon only when the air conditioning system is operating and Freon is flowing through the gauge. Right. If you see air bubbles in the Freon that flows through the sight gauge after the system has been running about five minutes, the Freon supply is low. And if no bubbles are seen, the supply is okay. After the Freon passes through the sight gauge, it goes to the strainer dryer, where dirt is screened out and moisture removed. Next, the Freon goes to an expansion valve, also located in the evaporator unit in the luggage compartment. You might compare this expansion valve with the valve on the steam heating system which feeds water into the boiler as needed. Actually, this expansion valve is a chamber in which the pressure on the liquid freon is relieved so that it can start to change to a gas. So its temperature starts to drop as the pressure drops. Is that it? That's right, Bill. From this expansion valve, the freon, which is now changing to a gas, goes to another unit called the evaporator. The evaporator is large, so the pressure is relieved some more, and the Freon continues to evaporate. By the time it reaches the opposite end of the evaporator, it is all gas. That's the secret of air conditioning, because while it is changing to a gas, it is absorbing heat. You might compare this process to the water in our boiler, absorbing heat from the fire to change the water to a gas. Only we don't need to apply fire to the Freon. Tech's right. Our Freon gas is going to absorb heat from the air which surrounds the evaporator. This is the air drawn out of the passenger compartment, right? That's it, Bill. That air plus the fresh air drawn from the outside. Blowers draw the air in, circulate it around the evaporator coils, and blow it back into the car after it's been filtered and has had the heat and moisture taken out of it. Here's the point you want to remember about the evaporator. Moisture contained in the air will condense on the evaporator coils and drain out on the road. That's a normal condition, and there are two little tubes, one on each side, to drain off this moisture. That's good point, Tech. How does this Freon gas get back into liquid form again, Lou? <laughs> Wait a minute, Fred. You're getting ahead of me. I'm coming to that now when we talk about the compressor. This is the compressor mounted here in the engine compartment. After leaving the evaporator, the expanded Freon gas is drawn to the compressor through its suction line. Well, what's the compressor's job, Lou? 
You better turn the record over before you answer that, Lou. You're running out of talking space. Now we're all set. About that compressor, Bill, its job is to build up pressure on the Freon gas. Remember, by compressing a gas, we increase its temperature. In fact, the temperature of the Freon gas goes up so high, it can be cooled at summer temperatures. And this brings us up to another phase in the operation of the system. Right. You remember that we just said that compressing the Freon raises the temperature at which it will condense back into a liquid. This, as we've said, is done by the compressor. Now, our compressed Freon gas has a high temperature as it leaves the compressor. So it's easy to see that a cooling effect will change it back into a liquid. Right, Lou. And this action takes place in the condensers, located here in front of the radiator and fan. You mean that the air blowing across these condensers causes the Freon gas to change back into a liquid? That's right, Bill. Going along with our steam heating comparison, you might say that the condenser could be likened to the radiator in the steam heating plant, where the steam gives up its heat and is changed back into water for its trip back to the boiler. Now, take a look at this condenser. You'll notice that like the evaporator, it also has thin tubing for maximum contact with the circulating air. Only this unit does an opposite job. Right. You'll remember that the Freon gas flowing through the evaporator drew heat out of the air drawn from the passenger compartment. Now, the Freon that passes through the condenser contains that heat. Remember, we told you that a hotter substance always loses its heat to a cooler substance, and that's what's happening in the condenser. That's it, Tech. When the colder outside air strikes the condenser tubes, the heat in the warmer Freon in the tubes is drawn off to the air. So the Freon condenses and becomes a liquid. Then it returns to the receiver. And that's the complete refrigeration cycle. The liquid Freon is again directed from the receiver through the sight gauge and the strainer dryer to the evaporator, where it again starts the cooling cycle. That wasn't too hard to understand, was it, Bill? Oh, I believe I understand how it works now, Lou. You or Bill got any questions you want to ask, Fred? I've got one. How is the temperature controlled? That's a good question, Bill. It's controlled by a temperature control valve located in the evaporator unit in the luggage compartment. Well, is that valve set for the right temperature at the factory, or can you adjust it? The answer to both questions is yes, but it's set for average conditions, so there should be little occasion to tinker with it. Tech's right, Bill. However, if it should be necessary to adjust it, you'll find instructions in the reference book. How does this temperature control valve operate, Lou? It's controlled by a thermal bulb mounted on an aluminum strut extending from the evaporator coils. The bulb is located in the air stream of the air being drawn out of the car interior, Bill. When the temperature in the car starts to get colder than the set temperature, the control valve opens and hot Freon gas passes through a bypass line from the compressor. It enters the distribution manifold between the expansion valve and the evaporator and adds heat to the Freon entering the evaporator, thereby maintaining the set temperature. The thermal bulb, which operates the temperature control valve, also prevents the evaporator from icing. If the evaporator gets too cold, it lowers the temperature of the bulb through the strut, causing the valve to send hot gas into the evaporator. The mounting of that bulb is important to the operation of the system. So be sure you don't change it if you're working in the evaporator unit. What's the story on maintenance of this air conditioning system, Lou? Well, actually, there aren't many things that can go wrong, Bill. You'll find a complete maintenance story in the reference book. But we can cover some quick checks you can make before getting into actual service. For example, there is a possibility of belt slippage. All of the belts must be adjusted so there is no more than a quarter of an inch deflection from a 9 to 12 pound pull on a scale. You adjust belt tension by means of the idler pulleys, huh? Yes, or by moving the generator, depending on the belt system used. You want to be sure the condensers are clean, not plugged up with leaves and bugs. You need free passage of air through those condensers to carry off the heat from the Freon. Right, Tech, that's important. Clean the condensers and the radiator 
by blowing compressed air through them from the engine side. And then, of course, you want to make sure there's enough Freon in the system. You can check that through the sight gauge in the luggage compartment, like I told you a few minutes ago. If the Freon supply is low, it's because there's a leak somewhere in the system, isn't it? That's right, Bill. That's the only way you can lose Freon. And we've got two guys that can track down any leak. I call them Sniffy and Soapy. Sniffy and Soapy? <laughs> Say, what are you doing, pulling my leg? <laughs> Not at all, Bill. Tech's talking about the halide leak detector and a special soap-like product also used for checking the leaks. Here's how they work. Light this halide leak detector and adjust the flame until it is very small. Then probe around suspected leak areas with a searching tube. If you find a small leak, the flame will turn blue. And a larger leak will turn it green or even purple. And remember this. Don't get your big nose too close to your work. Inhaling the fumes from freon gas and flame can be dangerous because that combination creates a poisonous gas. So work in a spot that has lots of air. That's a good point to remember, Tech. Now, we use Tech's pal Soapy by applying it to any suspected leak spots. If Soapy starts to bubble, you found a leak. Well, how do we correct these leaks when we locate them, Lou? Often by merely tightening a fitting, Bill. Here's something that's good to remember. If you're ever caught in a traffic jam and the air conditioning system doesn't seem to work as good as it did, you can improve the cooling by running the engine at a fast idle. This draws more air through the condensers and takes the heat out of the Freon faster. Say, Lou, uh, isn't there the chance that some of these units may have to be removed if we want to work on other parts of the car? Yes, there is, Fred. And you'll also find that story in the reference book. But there's one point I want to emphasize. Always remember to protect your eyes with goggles when working around Freon gas. The gas itself is not harmful, but spray droplets of Freon will freeze immediately on any part of the body they come in contact with. And as I said before, don't work in a confined area when you're disconnecting these units. Freon gas itself is odorless and non-poisonous, but a concentration of the gas in flame will produce a poisonous gas. Well, that gives you a brief story on the air conditioning system. As we've said, there's plenty more information in the reference book, so be sure to read it carefully. And let me add this. You're going to like working on this air conditioning unit. It's something new and different. Sort of a challenge to a good mechanic like yourself, Bill. <laughs> well, thanks, Tech. I mean it, Bill. Learn how to take care of the air conditioning unit, and you'll get a lot of personal satisfaction. And at the same time, you'll let the customer know that you know what you're doing when it comes to giving him good service. <laughs>